February the 13th, 1966, Krakow, Poland. Children were out sledging, but 19-year-old Carol Cott was looking for a very different kind of thrill. This is somebody who chose to do evil. He knew the difference between right and wrong, and yet he chose to harm others anyway. Cott spotted an 11-year-old boy walking alone and approached him. The press called him a, a vampire and a beast. The people were really, really afraid. Spurred by an insatiable lust for blood, Cott grabbed the boy and drove his bayonet into the child's chest repeatedly. He stabbed the boy 11 times, puncturing every vital organ. Cott killed as a schoolboy at the age of 21. He had already stood trial for two counts of murder, 10 counts of attempted murder. The perverse pleasure he derived from harming the most vulnerable of victims makes Carol Cott one of the world's most evil killers. Krakow, southern Poland. Beginning in 1964, a young man called Karol Kot developed a lust for blood that earned him the moniker, the Vampire of Krakow. He would terrify the city for the next two years. Kot was, without question, one of the world's most evil killers, not least because he killed all his victims while effectively a schoolboy. He was completely lacking in remorse, and he was so young. To completely lack a conscience, to be a kind of fully formed killer before he's even age 20 is really shocking. Still at school, Carol Cott had killed two people, an 11-year-old boy at a sledging competition and an 86-year-old woman as she prayed. Cott had attempted to kill at least a dozen more. Fascinated by the sinister story, Marta wrote a book on Cott. Women were afraid to go out to church anymore if they were going to a church. Some of them were putting like some metal balls or other objects like pillows, um, attaching them to their backs so they can protect themselves. Coroner Tomasz Konopka closely studied the Carol Cott case. Only two people died as a result of Carol Cott's activity, but the way he killed, his approach towards murder was unique. Killing gave him pleasure. One of the characteristics of Carol Cott was that after he would kill, he took great pleasure in licking the knife and tasting the blood. This aspect of the vampirism is something that has made his crimes sufficiently unique. This killer's story begins a little over 70 years ago. Karol Kot was born in Krakow in southern Poland on December the 18th, 1946, to a middle-class family. On the surface, their home life seemed happy and healthy. His father worked as an engineer, his mother was a stay-at-home mum, and they were quite a respectable family. It was like a good, loving family. Uh, his mother uh, didn't work uh, especially for him, so he didn't have to go to preschool. And um, he was raised in a um, Jewish uh, quarter of Krakow. But when Carol Cott was eight years old, his sister was born. I think that really did unsettle him quite a lot because he's been used to being the centre of attention for eight years. He feels that she's the favoured one. And whether or not that's true, um, often when we look at dynamics in families, it's not what parents are doing or not doing, it's how children are perceiving that. So I think he felt pushed out, I think he felt slighted right from the beginning. 
Later, Carol Cote said that his parents loved her more than him. He said, that's why he abused her. He tried to introduce military order at home. I think Cot's relationship with his sister is a warning sign. And this was the beginning, I think, of a process for Cot, um, a, a process of expressing himself in, in a dysfunctional way when things weren't going as he wanted them to go. Uh, and it's one that, that escalates slowly over time. Another sign that all was not well with the boy was his cruelty to animals. They had two cats in the house and he was like treating cats badly. He was throwing them at the walls, things like that. Often when we look back at the childhoods of serial killers, we see some form of, of harm, some form of abuse towards animals. And, and this is something that individuals do to maintain some control because they have feelings of, of trauma, of anxiety, of, of basically feeling slighted, of feeling left out. On family holidays to the village of Pachim, 30 miles south of Krakow, Kot developed an unnatural passion. He developed a fascination with slaughterhouses. On holiday, he would go with his parents and ask to go to the slaughterhouse. Now, this is quite unusual in a young man of 10, 11, 12. That's when he understood that he loves blood. He's fascinating with blood. He was talking about it like um, he noticed that blood is still warm. It was alive just a moment ago, and it's, that it was something very special for him. One of the most extraordinary incidents when he was in the slaughterhouse was that the slaughterman drained blood into a cup and passed it to him for him to drink. They thought this boy would simply freak out. He did exactly the opposite. He drank the blood, which in turn freaked them out. Here's a child who goes on family holidays to the countryside, and what, what do normal children do? What are they interested in? They're interested in playing, running through the woods, maybe picking flowers, right? Uh, swimming if it's possible. What does Carol Cott want to do? He wants to slice up an animal and he wants to drink the animal's blood, and he wants to do it in front of people, and he wants them to be entertained by it or amazed by it. This is extraordinarily rare behavior. At the same time, young Carol Cott developed a disturbing fetish. He said that knife was like his biggest love uh, he can think of. He was admiring uh, knives. He actually can speak uh, in surprisingly sophisticated language about knives. Cot's rare obsession would soon prove deadly. This is uh, a weapon. This is something that he can use to threaten other people. And carrying a knife makes him feel important. It makes him feel powerful. Later, he started to think, how, how does it feel to put knife into a human body? But he didn't have the courage. So he started to hurting small animals at first. And he noticed that uh, blood affects him. It makes him excited. While at school, Cot joined a target shooting club where he met a girl, Danusha, that he soon became obsessed with. She was six years older than Carol. They became like friends, but from his uh, side, I think this uh, relationship looked a bit different. I think she treated him as a friend and he was in love. It wouldn't surprise me if this relationship wasn't one of equals because I think here we've got a young lad who has difficulty relating to other people. He doesn't have those social skills. In a twisted bid to impress Danusha, Cot revealed to her some of his sadistic fantasies and cruel acts he had committed. I suspect she finds him cute. She's sure the stories are untrue or made up, um, but, but she's just not excited by them. And in some ways, that's exactly what Cot needs. He, he needs somebody who can hear his craziness, who he can brag to, who he can story tell to, who he can relive with, uh, and not have them screaming bloody murder. On a shooting club outing, the young Cot could not contain his violent urges. 
after having told her that he's this person, he attempts to prove it to her by attacking her and even starting to strangle her. He attacked her. He pulled out a piece of broken glass from his pocket. He told her he wanted to cut her wrists and throw her into the river so it would look like a suicide. This is basically his frustrations because he can't get what he wants. And the only way that he knows to get what he wants, based on his past experience, is to be violent, is to be abusive, is to be manipulative. But it doesn't quite work with Danusha. She responds in a very interesting way. Uh, she laughs. She doesn't take it seriously. And tells him, in essence, well, you know everyone knows that we're together today, so if you kill me, um, you'll definitely be caught. And he stops. What you have to be impressed with is the woman herself, because her momentary psychological sophistication probably saved her life. But on September the 21st, 1964, the 17-year-old schoolboy felt compelled to attack a stranger for the first time. Carol Cott was describing that day, the urge of killing was so incredible that he just couldn't calm down and he started to walk across the town with a knife. And then he thought that he would search for some lonely woman uh, in a church. And he went to one of the churches and he was waiting. Cott later said he was about to leave when 48-year-old Helena entered a church in the center of the city to pray. He took out a German military bayonet from the sheath and he stabbed her in the back. He stabbed her just like once uh, in her back, trying to reach the heart from the back. When someone is stabbed, they will describe feeling as if they've been punched. You don't necessarily get that sharp feeling you might imagine. And that would be a surprise, it would be a shock, it would be unpleasant. It's only when there's blood coming out that they, they realise what's going on. So in the moments in this blitz attack, I think perhaps this victim didn't really understand what was going on. Remarkably, the 48-year-old woman survived. To stab someone to the back, you are primarily looking at damage to the heart, damage to the lungs, and that certainly can be lethal, but it's not usually instantly fatal. The woman didn't realize that this had happened. She probably didn't feel any pain. It was only after she left that she realized when she went to a shop and someone told her that her clothes were bloodstained. The interesting thing about the first attack is it shows you how naive he is. He, he, his stabbing behavior doesn't have a chance of killing anyone. He doesn't understand really how you kill somebody, right? So it's like he's exploring it. It's like he rushes in, he stabs, he waits for something to happen. He thinks magic's gonna happen. Blood's gonna be everywhere and he's gonna have a dead body. But the schoolboy's bloody intent was far from blunted. So here we've got this individual who associates power and status with harm and, and whether or not his victims die, that's probably not something he really cares about. Krakow, Poland, September the 23rd, 1964. Just two days after his first attack, 17-year-old Carol Cott was on the prowl again. His next target was an elderly woman chosen at random. The second attack happens only two days later, and I think this illustrates how much he enjoyed the first attack and how much he wanted to continue, but the high that had come along with that. In my mind, I think he was painting his own picture, the life of Carol Cott. He was fulfilling, blossoming, if you like, into a fully-fledged killer. I think he set himself that dream. The butterfly was emerging from the chrysalis. Cott wanted to kill again, but still a schoolboy, the young man needed a victim who wouldn't fight back. 
One characteristic that connects all the incidents was that he attacked single people, single, meaning there were no witnesses. I think the choice of victims here is no accident whatsoever. We know that elderly people and elderly women in particular are one of the target groups for serial killers because they are physically weaker and they are often on their own and that vulnerability makes it easy to, to target them and, and to take their lives. Cott's next victim was a 78-year-old woman called Francesca. He spotted her getting off a tram. When she entered the apartment building, Cot attacked. Cot stabbed her, again in the back. This time, she felt the pain more quickly. But equally, Cot disappeared. Francesca did indeed survive the attack, but she never recovered from her wounds. The stabbings pierced her backbone and she had problems walking for the rest of her life. I think that Cott, with all of his victims, he was trying to kill them, but he wasn't willing to hang around long enough to make sure of it. He was trying to escape. The news of the shocking attacks rattled the citizens of Krakow, but that only served to embolden 17-year-old Carol Cott. There would have been a bit of a buzz, a bit of a fear in the community around them. And to know that he's created this is something that he's going to be really enjoying. So he will be escalating his offending. It is going to be more violent, more serious, more prolonged. Just six days later, on September the 29th, 1964, Cott spotted an elderly woman near a nunnery in Krakow. Armed with his bayonet, he followed her into the nunnery. And she's also stabbed from behind, but, but this one seems to have been more ferocious, given that he's driven the knife into her with, with much more ferocity, much more force. Never in a million years would you think that, that somebody has just randomly come and stabbed you. So, so it would have been incredibly shocking. This time, his victim, 86-year-old Maria, died. But not before she managed to say a few last words to the nun who found her. The nun said that when she got close to her, she was laying on the floor, breathing heavily. And she said just two words, young boy. Today, one of Poland's leading coroners, Thomas Konopka, works at the same hospital where Maria's post-mortem was carried out. The post-mortem examination was conducted here, in this autopsy room. The examination showed that the wound was not deep. The wound went through the back, through the muscles, and ended in the backbone. The conclusion was that because of the pain and shock related to the stabbing in the back, her heart gave out and she died. The senseless murder committed by a schoolboy was headline news across Poland. Panic broke out in Krakow. People were afraid of going out in the evenings, especially women. People were warned not to go out alone, not to go alone to the church. I think it was very difficult for the inhabitants of Krakow to comprehend that a, a boy could be responsible. The first reaction was disbelief. The second reaction was fear. And then, in the autumn of 1964, Cott's knife attacks suddenly stopped. I think he just calmed down after he actually, for the first time, succeed to kill someone. Uh, he was just continued going to school, going to his uh, shooting section, uh, just normal everyday life. Cot had got away with murder, but his deadly desires had not stopped. 
In fact, his murderous urges were growing. He appeared to have stopped killing for a two-year period, but during that period of time, he still would have been having violent thoughts and violent fantasies, and, and we can see that, that this is exactly the case with him. He was still bent on killing, but this time he wanted to murder en masse. So at the end of 1964, Carol Cott changed his M.O. He, he turns his offending to, towards other outlets, setting fires, poisoning. So he's always creating harm. He's always externalizing his trauma to hurt other people. He confessed that he had planned to kill a large number of people by changing his method to poisoning or arson. He was putting poison, for example, into a bottle of beer and leaving that bottle of beer uh, somewhere and hoping that someone will um, be tempted to drink it. But thankfully, Cott's plan failed. When you look at what he actually does, it really confirms how completely devoid of, uh, of ordinary social understandings he has. He does things like go to drinking establishments, leave out drinks, half drunk, that have lethal doses of arson, and sits and waits for somebody to pick up the drink and drop dead. He, he doesn't have a grasp of social behavior that people don't go around bars picking up half drunk drinks and drinking them. That's just not what people do. Cot then turned to arson. He committed at least four arsons. We only know about them from his testimony. That's because these were failed arsons. For example, he poured gasoline on some rags in a room, and he hoped it would start a fire. It did not. He tried to set an attic on fire. He said there was smoke and fire, but no inferno. Fortunately, no one was killed in any of the four fires that he set. Again, he doesn't even know how to set a fire. He can't, he can't get a whole structure to, to burn down to save his life. He's, he's just trying to find a way to get death to happen, doing as little as possible, and he can't seem to figure it out. By February of 1966, 17 months after his first murder, Cott could no longer contain the urge to kill again. I think he definitely would have been fantasizing during that period about those attacks he carried out before. So he carried out some very violent attacks that had, had a real impact on the local community. He created fear and he was reveling in that. He was enjoying that. And when he came to kill again, it was going to be something horrendous. But this time he changes direction. He doesn't target elderly women. He targets children. He goes to a local mound which attracts tobogganists, particularly children. On Sunday, February the 13th, 1966, Carol Cott was looking for an easy target when he spotted 11-year-old Lesek. He was just walking alone because he was a bit late to that competition. And Carol just was walking around looking for a victim. For the sec, the speed of the attack would likely have been stunning. And this attack is really ferocious, so he turns the boy towards him. He stabs him 11 times. Now, this is a real ramping up of his offending. So he's not just killing this individual. He's using much more violence than he needs to get that job done. So this is about more than that. This is about completely obliterating someone. This is about saying, well, I can do to you whatever I want to do to you. It's about status, it's about power, and it's about entitlement. We must be grateful to some extent that stab wounds are not usually tremendously painful. They can often feel more like a punch, but it must have been utterly confusing and bewildering that somebody has suddenly 
started to assault you. And then very quickly, within probably seconds in this case, you will lose consciousness and die. You've gone from being a normal child, doing normal childhood things, to being a body. The autopsy later revealed that Cot had punctured every major organ in the young boy's body. The stabs were deep. The strikes damaged the aorta, the heart, the lungs and the liver. The boy had no chance of surviving the attack. As Lesec lay bleeding to death, Cot walked away. He just left him like this and walked away. What also surprised me was that he said that he went straight to the patisserie, bought some cakes and took them home. The attack on the 11-year-old boy was a clear sign that Cot's ferocity had escalated. This is Cot in his new form. This is the fully-fledged butterfly. He's absolutely at one and determined to destroy this victim. It isn't very long before he chooses another. Krakow, southern Poland. By the end of February 1966, Carol Cott, now aged 19, had viciously attacked four people with a knife, killing two, 86-year-old Maria and an 11-year-old boy, Lesek. But Carol Cott's lust for blood was far from satiated. On April the 14th, 1966, two months after he last killed, Cott struck again. His next attack is on a seven-year-old girl, so he's targeting vulnerable victims. He's targeting people who he feels he can control, who he feels he's got power over. Cot hid in the stairwell of a city tenement building and waited for a suitable victim to attack. His decision depended on who would appear. A seven-year-old girl came to the mailbox from the upstairs. He approached her, grabbed her with one hand and stabbed her with the other. He stabbed her eight times and left the girl wounded and bleeding. Incredibly, seven-year-old Malgosha survived the brutal attack. However, the psychological scars would last a lifetime. These children, because they are only just kind of forming their, their, their views of the world, their, their views of other people, and to be attacked randomly by someone who is also just a child is something that, that will, will stay with them forever and is going to, to shape their relationships with other people. Very often people who are attacked as children can move on from it. They, they can go on and have fulfilling lives and, and move on from their trauma, but it's something that really is going to set them off um, the, the track that they were on for, for quite some time. After the vicious attack, Cot confessed to attacking the seven-year-old girl to the woman he was still obsessed with, Danusha. He tells her what he's done, and, and I don't think this is, is any kind of remorse or any kind of catharsis. I think this is, look at me, look what I can achieve. You should be impressed by this. For some reason, Cot decides to boast that he has attacked the child. She doesn't believe him. She thinks it's fantasy, another of Cot's constructions until she reads about the story in a local newspaper about the stabbing. The horrific truth then dawned on Danusha. She realizes that the man, the young man she's known, may be more dangerous than she thought he was. And she talks to a psychiatrist about the confession. He advises her to go immediately to the police. Ultimately, the one person in the world who he could trust was the avenue to his being caught. For the investigators, Danusha's information would prove crucial in identifying the schoolboy killer 
who had plagued Krakow for the last two years. Coupled with the description given by some of the surviving victims, Carol Cott was now the police's prime suspect. But they did not immediately arrest him. In the months between April and July, they placed him under surveillance. And there was a good reason for that. They wanted to be absolutely sure that he was capable, that he was sane, and indeed they wanted him to sit his school examinations to prove it. So the police waited until after he'd finished his exams before they arrested him. But this was a really high risk strategy as well, because you're waiting to arrest somebody who has committed violent offence after violent offence. And I think this really did put the public at risk. In the summer of 1966, a few months after his last attack, the Polish police finally apprehended Karol Kot. And it's after his final exams in school, and I think that really does bring home how, how horrific this is, the, these horrendous crimes that have been committed by somebody who's so young, and when he's arrested, he's arrested in school. The most striking moment of the case was uh, when Karol Kot was arrested, and everybody realised that the beast, which was everybody afraid for such a long time, for two years, was just a, a young schoolboy. Finally, the young man was under arrest. You could say that Krakow breathed a sigh of relief. People stopped being afraid of a killer. But Carol Cott was not ready to admit his guilt. But when he was presented to the two elderly ladies that survived the first attacks, he was instantly identified by them. He even said to one of them, the one that shouted at him, it's him, that if she wanted, he would finish killing her. Carol Cott had no choice but to confess to his crimes. Cott doesn't plead innocence. He glories in his guilt. That is exactly what he's always wanted. This is the tableau that he wanted to paint for himself. He tells them in elaborate detail about the way he killed. He bragged about these crimes. He talked about these acts like it gave him pleasure. The press give him the nickname that he must have lusted after, the Vampire of Krakow. I think he wanted to forever be remembered as one of the city's most dramatic residents. I wouldn't call him dramatic, I would call him depraved. The term vampire was used, not only because he killed, but also because he drank the blood of his victims. He said openly that when he killed or maimed his victims, he took pleasure in licking the blood off the blade of the knife. I think he really would have relished being called the vampire of Krakow. This is somebody who has got quite a narcissistic element to their personality. They want to be noticed. They, they think that they deserve to be noticed. They're, they're entitled to, to be lauded by other people. And I think having that name, that the vampire of Krakow, this brings with it some kind of status. And I think this is very important for him. Soon after he was arrested in July of 1966, 19-year-old Carol Cott gleefully participated in the reconstructions of his crimes. You know, police do reenactments as a common technique, and there are many reasons to do that. One of the most important reasons to do that is a reenactment is one of the ways that you determine whether or not a person claiming to be a killer is the real killer or whether or not they are somebody who are just seeking the fame. The reenactment will show whether or not you did the crime in a way that is consistent with the physical evidence, and it allows you to be more sure. 
A reconstruction can be a useful thing to do. It enables witnesses' memories to be jogged. It, it sometimes leads to, to new evidence. But, but in this case, I, I think he got more out of it than anybody else did. He was actually a kind of uh, directing all the show. And he was just saying to cameraman or where to put lights, I'm going to start from that direction, so bad light shouldn't be here, you will, you will not see anything, and stuff like that. He was up on a pedestal. He was important for that moment. There was a crowd of policemen around him, a crowd of people, and finally, he could start showing off. One of the policemen asked me, does it feel the same to do it all over again? He says, uh, he said that, well, almost, but I'm missing just one thing. And police a man ask, what is it? And he said, blood. If there were any doubts among the police officers as to Cott's guilt, the young man's reaction during the reconstructions put them to rest. It was obvious that he did it because they made the reconstruction of all five attacks. And he was saying, he was showing every details what exactly he was doing. He did not show any remorse. He was proud of what he did. He described the series of murders. He even showed how he licked the blood of the blade after he committed the homicide. Carol Cott was put on trial in Krakow on the 3rd of May, 1967. Cott, killed as a schoolboy, stood trial for two counts of murder, ten counts of attempted murder, four counts of arson, all before the age of 20. In addition to his knife attacks on the two children and three elderly women, Cott was also prosecuted for the many other lives he was deemed to have put at risk in his poison and arson attacks. Obviously, everybody was in shock. His whole family and friends were in shock that such an innocent-looking person from such a good family could do such terrible things. In all, 64 witnesses testified at the trial. Many took to the stand to vouch for the young man's character. Initially, everybody defended him, not only his family, but even his school teachers. There is a letter in the files written by his shooting section trainer that shows his support for Kut and his innocence. But Kut's behavior in the courtroom shocked both friend and foe the young man who'd killed two innocent people and had attempted to murder many more relished the limelight. He was cheerful. He was laughing. While his friends were testifying, he was waving to them. You could see that on the films shot in the courtroom. He was proud then that he could perform almost like an actor, that he was the center of attention. He was even proud of what he did. It horrifies me. During the trial, Cott displayed disdain for the pain and suffering he'd inflicted on the innocent. At, at the trial, he just showed a complete disregard for his victims and their families. There was an absolute lack of remorse. And that doesn't surprise me whatsoever, because here we have somebody who only cares about themselves. If he felt sorry, he would only feel sorry for himself. He'd only be sorry that he got caught. And unfortunately, you're, you're never going to get sympathy from somebody like this. They don't care about the mayhem that they create. They just care about what it's done for them. He showed no remorse. There was no apologies to the victims. He simply went blank because he was fulfilling his own fantasy of himself. He was fulfilling the painting that he'd always wanted to paint of his life. This was Cott's creation and the killings were that. He didn't ever admit that he's feeling sorry. He was saying that to him it was moral, because what brings you pleasure, that is moral, and that it was his private thing that he was taking 
uh, someone else's life, but he doesn't think that he is criminal. Cot soon alienated his family and friends. Had he not been caught, I think he would have just gone on to kill even more people in even more violent ways. This is somebody who, who enjoyed killing, who enjoyed feeling power over others. When he started to say that it brought him pleasure and he would continue to kill, the voices of support fell away. Cart confessed in detail to all of his crimes. Usually the perpetrators of such killings defend themselves, try to come up with any line of defense. He did not do that. After a series of appeals on March the 17th, 1968, Poland's Supreme Court convicted Karol Kot of two counts of murder, 10 counts of attempted murder, and four counts of arson. When he was sentenced, the judge said of him that he was more dangerous than a savage beast because he was endowed with reason. Cot was certainly not insane. He never for one moment expressed an item of regret or remorse for any of his victims. At the age of 21, Cot was sentenced to death. On May the 16th, 1968, the 21-year-old Carol Cott was hanged by the neck and executed, thereby ending the story of a boy, and it's fair to call him a boy, who could truly be called one of the world's most evil killers. Till the end, even after he was sentenced to death, he said in an interview that if he were to be released, he would kill again. And Carol Cott was a psychopath. He knew what he was doing. He knew that it was wrong. This is somebody who chose to do evil. He knew the difference between right and wrong, and yet he chose to harm others anyway. The senseless and sadistic murder of the most vulnerable of victims, an 11-year-old boy and an 86-year-old woman as well as the attempted murder of children and the elderly while still at school, makes Carol Cott one of the world's most evil killers.